was a 56 year old woman who had neck pain, who went to an urgent care clinic and she lived in an underserved area where, you know, she didn't really have good medical care. So the doctor at that urgent care ordered an x-ray and this is what the x-ray looks like. And if you were present at our, um, our first session a month ago, Dr. Rizzoli talked about the anatomy of the cervical spine a little bit. So you will remember, or if those of you are new, we'll explain it again, that this is not a normal looking x-ray. So this is a lateral view of the cervical spine. And when we look at these, we look at the spinal alignment, which is all, everything's lined up, normal alignment. We look at the height of the vertebral bodies. We look at the disc space height. All those things are normal in this case. But one thing that's abnormal in this case is the soft tissues in front of the cervical spine. You should not really be able to notice those very much. They should be pretty close to the cervical spine. So something is wrong here. Now, I'm not sure where, um, when this got read, and I don't know if the results got conveyed to the patient because she didn't get any further care until she came into our ER. This was at my prior institution. Three weeks later, with this appearance on a CAT scan, so no, the first picture is an x-ray. That's why I just showed you. I flipped it around. So it's the same as this CAT scan. And I'm assuming nowadays, as medical students, you all know what a CAT scan looks like, what an x-ray looks like, and even an MRI, basically. So I don't want to go into too much detail. But you can see on this lateral view, the sagittal view, as we call it for CT and MR, of the cervical spine, that there have been some changes since that x-ray. Here at the C3, C4 level, now these vertebral bodies do not have normal vertebral body height anymore. This disc is gone. There's no longer normal disc space height. It's not aligned anymore. It's not a straight line like it used to be. So now there is destruction and there's what we call subluxation of this C3 vertebral body into the spinal canal. And we still see these very prominent prevertebral soft tissues, which is very abnormal. Now this person got another CAT scan with contrast. And that's not the normal way things go, but in some county hospitals where this was taken, uh, MRI was not immediately available. So this is what the surgeons did for surgical planning until they could get the MRI, because this was kind of a case they wanted to treat emergently. You can see again, there is subluxation. We've lost our normal alignment of the cervical spine. Here, there's a little bit of enhancement. This is a post-contrast CAT scan, a little bit of enhancement from the spine and behind the spine. This is the epidural space, and this is the prevertebral space, and there should be no soft tissue and no enhancement there. Now, this is an axial view cut straight through like this, if you can see me at the top. And you can see there, this is the um, vertebral body. These are the posterior elements. This is the spinal canal. And there's abnormal enhancement in the front of the spinal canal, which is epidural, it's phlegmon, which is inflammatory tissue on its way to becoming an abscess and pre-vertebral phlegmon or abscess. So this is a surgical emergency, or is it? Actually, let me stop there. So this case came into the ER. So the ER doc evaluated it first. First thing they did, order imaging. I read these images. Now, who's consulted? Dr. Zuli. who comes in first? Is it you? Uh, uh do you send your medical student? <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would be it would be a, a resident. Let's just say theoretically, if this, this was at a, an academic center, so the resident would come and evaluate this patient, um, or a medical student, uh, who would then ultimately uh, sign this out to a resident, who would then ultimately uh, make its way over to me. So, uh, so, so the, the the short of your of your question is yes. Ultimately, this would this is a patient who definitely needs uh, neurosurgical care. So, um, let's let's look at it. You 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 literally hit all the all the points, the you know, nails on the head in terms of all the, um, all the, uh, the kind of the detail um, aspects of this patient's imaging. Let me talk a little bit about, about more how I look at this in terms of uh, surgical planning and some of the clinical characteristics. So as you mentioned before, um, you can see this patient has very significant prevertebral soft tissue swelling, okay? Now, uh, very rarely can this compromise the patient's airway, all right? So the first thing I look at is look at the trachea in front of the the soft tissues. Uh, you know what? You can't see my pointer, but you can see that this it's totally pain, right? So this patient's not having any breathing difficulty. So that's good. All right. So the patient's airway is secure. Now the next thing is looking at the patient's alignment. So look at the look at the CAT scans compared to the patient's X-ray. So although the X-ray was a little bit abnormal, look at the alignment, right? Remember in, uh, in the last week's sessions, I don't know if you guys were here, but I talked about contour lines, right? 
there are four of them, anterior, posterior, spinal laminar, and the spinous process contour lines, right? So if you just draw kind of straight lines down the fronts and backs of the vertebral bodies, uh, behind the lamina and the spinous processes, you just kind of want to see a smooth, gradual transition between each one of those things, right? On the x-ray, it looks pretty good, honestly. But if you look, I mean, you don't need to have a spinal surgery background or a neuroradiology background to know something looks very abnormal there, right? So what you see here is basically, this is pretty characteristic of osteomyelitis, um, discitis, and an epidural abscess around uh, C3 and C4 vertebral bodies. You can see there's destruction of C3, there's collapse of the uh, vertebral bodies, there's, um, and there's basically kyphosis that's developing above, okay? So a general rule of thumb is the disc space, the disc spaces for the most part should be parallel with the floor, okay? Look at the C2-3 disc space, right? It's essentially at a 45 degree angle from the floor, right? All right, well, that's not normal, okay? <laughs> and something needs to be done about it. Now, the question is, what well, would have been nice here, but not necessary, this, this patient needs surgery. There's, there's essentially no question about that, right? Sometimes what I like to get in these cases, assuming that the kyphosis wasn't that bad, is a AP and lateral x-ray, and usually these patients are wearing collars with a collar on. And I can tell you a lot about what this patient's alignment would look like in a collar. If there was even a question um, that conservative management could be the option for this patient, which is not, I wanna preface that, but if you were thinking about conservative management, you could get an AP and lateral x-ray with a patient in a collar to see what their alignment was. And you cannot, you cannot, I wanna kind of stress this, you cannot judge a patient's alignment based on a CT or MRI. It does not give, remember these patients are, are laying supine and they're not bearing any weight when they get these images done. However, with x-rays, they are the most physiologic uh, imaging modality that uh, you will be able to have. So although it's become a little bit passe, it's, coming fall, it's falling back in the favor now to get x-rays on a lot of our patients because it's just amazing the amount of information you get from them. Anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. So anyway, so this patient has, uh, clearly has destruction of C3 and C4, subluxation of these vertebral bodies, spinal cord compression. I don't know what the patient's uh, neurologic exam is, but it would be important to know. Um, and the, the timing of the surgery, although this is an emergency, right? There's certain things that I think about as a surgeon that um, are important, okay? So I hate to say this, but the time of the day that this patient arrives and the time of the day that you're planning on taking this patient to surgery is very, very key because it's very different taking a patient to the OR at two o'clock in the morning as compared to seven o'clock in the morning, all right? Again, I hate to say that, but it's just the fact of, fact of life. So if this patient is neurologically intact, which sometimes, often they are, okay? And they had this scan and let's say this patient came in at midnight, I'm okay waiting until seven o'clock in the morning to take this patient to the OR, okay? Or maybe I could even take it the next day or, or during the week, assuming they came in over the weekend, all right? The neurologic exam trumps anything else you see on imaging, all right? The next thing is, um, <clears throat> if this patient was actually neurologically compromised, if they had some sort of findings, then that, that becomes a moot point. You have, you have to take this patient to the OR um, ASAP, all right? So- Is pain um, a neurologic finding? She had severe pain. Uh, Okay, no doubt it's just pain. Pain, pain, can be, uh, pain can be managed. So, uh, so now the thing, and usually the pain is due to instability and just kind of in, in inflammatory pain from the infection itself. And those things can be managed with medications and a collar and things like that. Because again, when you take a patient to the OR at, if you make the decision to, make the, to take the patient to the OR at like two o'clock in the morning, the, the team, the, the staff that you're dealing with is very, very different. And, and in particular, a weekend team is very, very different then the staff you're gonna be dealing with, let's say Monday morning at seven o'clock, and it, it's, uh, it adds uh, more layers of challenge to you as a surgeon in terms of getting this procedure done safely for the patient. And, um, and I hate to say it, but it is, it is a big factor. It is a big factor. Now, that's no longer a factor if the patient is emergent, and then you just have to, you just have to kind of deal with those things, okay? Um, now, I guess uh, the next question I could talk about is um, which approach, is this the same, this is not the same patient, right? No, let's, let's wait on your approach. Or are okay, you gonna so say which approach to surgery? Because we'll, 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 I have an MRI we'll, for this one if you wanna see it. Sure. I don't know if you wanna see it. You're gonna decide without it. You're gonna decide on your surgery. With these uh, two. Here's the, thing. Yeah, the, the patient needs surgery regardless of whether the MRI shows. So the MRI, while it's nice, it just, uh, it, it would, to me, I, I, would, I would take the patient based on the CAT scan, unless I had some 
unless I was really concerned that there was something else going on, um, like there was some big abscess there, it would guide my levels of um, decompression. But already I know in my mind what I want to do, and um, and it would not it would not really change my operative plan in any way. So I, I would not I personally would not get an MRI for this. I would just take it based on the CAT scan. But yeah. Regardless. So in this this I started with a case that was pretty dramatic which does need surgery and this because it is unstable there's cord compression it is in the cervical spine but now i'm going to show you other cases of infection where you will be called to look at the patient and it might you might be on your er rotation you might be on some other service it might not be a surgical case so but you you know as whatever service you're um, on at that time evaluating the patient you need to make that decision i'm going to show you an algorithm a little bit farther along in this lecture if we get to it, about how um, the University of Michigan approaches this. They have a great algorithm, which I tried to institute at USC, um, that is a good way of approaching based on labs, based on exam, based on imaging. And it's done very quickly because a lot of these patients need to be treated quickly either because they have deficits or because we need to do imaging and uh, biopsy to see what the bug is immediately before they start antibiotics. And usually you want to start antibiotic treatment on these patients as soon as possible Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.